of my favorite Catholic thinkers is Bishop Robert Barron, an auxiliary bishop of the Los Angeles Archdiocese, and he's the founder of Word on Fire Ministries. If you've ever had the chance to go online and listen to him, you find he is captivating, he's uh, interesting, and de definitely well um, placed to preach and to teach about our wonderful faith. On this third Sunday of Lent, when we hear John's gospel account of the cleansing of the temple, I'd like to share with you some of Bishop Barron's insights. In the book of Exodus, we learn that the Ten Commandments begin with an insistence that the Lord alone is our God and there are to be no other gods beside him. It's not just a principle meant to order our humanity's expressions of ritualized worship. Rather, it's a statement about the, the ethos of the entire moral and spiritual order. Whatever it is that humanity worships, be it the gods of the ancients or the allures of wealth and power, pleasure and honors, will by necessity give rise to our perceptions and practices that concern the moral life. The God or gods in whom we place our ultimate concern will direct our lives and determine our choices. Now, given that the Bible calls humanity over and over again to relinquish our attachment to false gods, and for us to embrace the worship of the one true God, we might take that emphasis as a means to interpret Christ's action in regards to the money changers in the temple of Jerusalem, actions that are traditionally referred to as the cleansing of the temple. This dramatic scene portrays Christ entering the sacred center of Israel's culture and worship at the height of the Jewish year, the Feast of Passover. Jesus then raises a commotion for he finds the temple to be not a house of prayer, but as he calls it, a marketplace. He turns over the tables of the money changers, disrupts the trade in animals for sacrifice, and cleans the place out. This scene is often interpreted as testimony against materialism in religious practice, as well it should be. But while sharing the aversion of using religion as a means to gain material wealth, I think a more fruitful way of understanding Christ's action to cleanse the temple can be discerned in relation to Israel's aversion to the worship of false gods and the necessity of cleansing our own temple, that is, our lives, of these fallen deities. Remember, St. Paul said that the body of each Christian is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, by this, he means a place where the one true God is honored and worshiped. The apostle is providing us with an image of the Christian life as one in which a person finds happiness and integration into the measure that she becomes personally a place where God is first. Think then that Christ has come not only to cleanse the temple of Jerusalem, but the temple of your own body, your own life. Our Lord Jesus comes into your life expecting to find a place ordered to the worship of the one true God. But what he finds at times can be a marketplace. What does this mean? Well, it means that our Lord Jesus finds a place where things other than God have become primary. To bring such idolatry closer to our cultural experience, how much of your life is given over to materialism or commercialism or the accumulation of things? What rivals to the one true God have we allowed to invade the sacred space of our soul? 
earlier, I referenced wealth and pleasure, power and honor. The question is, how are those things enshrined in the sanctuary of your own heart? The temple cleansing Christ is a memorable image that has enduring power. And we shouldn't relegate that image or our Lord himself to merely a statement about our impatience with the corruptions of religious institutions and miss the point that strikes closer to home. Christ comes to each of us to rid the temple of our own body of the idols to which we have foolishly given power and pride of place. My friends, our Lenten journey is all about learning how it is that God comes to us, how God sees us and how God is there to help us get our houses in order. So much of this process will depend on our own positive outlook and perception. Each and all of us are called to Christian discipleship. And I offer these thoughts from a book by Casey Cole entitled, Let Go, Seven Stumbling Blocks to Christian Discipleship. He writes, while we are quite familiar with being disappointed by the worst that we see in the world, we cannot deny the extraordinary heroism of which humanity is also capable. All around us, ordinary people are performing acts of sacrifice, giving up their own lives so that others may live. It's nearly impossible to look into the world and not see love overflowing at every turn. Science can't explain it, logic doesn't understand it, and yet love emanates more powerfully than any substance we can measure. Truth transcends any instrument or equation. In moments of pessimism, when we find ourselves impatient with the world, do not grow hopeless, but trust. Trust in the unexplainable love lived by so many. Trust the goodness you see. Be still and know that God is the source of all that is good, beautiful, and true. And that all love exists because God wills it.